Uh, we are very honored uh, this morning to host this uh, dialogue with the European Institute of Financial Regulation, uh, receiving uh, José Manuel Campa, uh, chairman of the European Banking Authority. Um, as you know, um, the European Institute of Financial Regulation has a very uh, uh, special role um, to try to um, intermediate, if we can say so, uh, relations between uh, regulators and regulees. Um, all our purpose is first to solve regulatory issues, because everybody from both sides think that there is some regulatory issues. Uh, but we want to solve the regulatory issues not through the classic um, lobby approach from one side, uh, but try to uh, to be uh, both sided uh, because we think that uh, one key to make regulation more efficient and um, addressing the real uh, collective uh, strategical issues is uh, to build up uh, trust and better understanding between all parties and doing that, uh, it's important to create a platform for uh, open dialogue uh, to better understand intentions from both sides, actions, initiatives, constraints, and uh, all together to try to uh, co-produce uh, this regulation, which is in the interest of all parties. Um, doing that, uh, we we agreed that uh, uh, financial issues, mainly after the crisis, are essential. Uh, it's our common goal. Uh, but we know that regulation is not neutral. And uh, it's very important to uh, adjust and to understand uh, interaction uh, between uh, regulation and the overall uh, strategy of the financial industry to fulfill uh, our collective uh, growth uh, objective, growth and competitive objective. Um, today, we are at the crossroad of a major historical uh, situation. Uh, we are facing uh, this major, this very important crisis, which is a real test of all the prudential uh, uh, framework. Uh, it's a real, uh, not just test, but a trust uh, environment. And it's interesting to take lessons about how um, in, in the real life uh, our framework worked. But more importantly, uh, the second uh, major challenge is what we call the industrial policy challenge. Uh, how, uh, based on the 42 uh, or 3 uh, Barnier's uh, directives or regulation, um, our uh, financial industry is facing uh, the objective, the strategical objective to uh, help uh, Europe to, to grow, and especially uh, what uh, are the, um, the context or the conditions, the competitive conditions uh, with the COVID, uh, we introduce sovereignty and so on and so on. What does it mean, sovereignty? Uh, we know that the regulators are uh, very uh, keen about uh, uh, triggering uh, critical mass also in the financial industry, uh, meaning to try to consolidate uh, some actors. We know also that some regulation are not totally in line uh, with this objective. Um, then what will be very interesting in this discussion this morning is not just uh, to address uh, the COVID issue, but also to put in relation the COVID issue with um, a certain vision from the regulators on how regulation can accompany uh, this uh, important paradox uh, 
that uh, since the previous uh, crisis, um, the uh, the strengths of the capital ratios of the banking industry never been so high, and and the risk uh, price, the risk prime, the risk of the industry has been also so high, meaning the uh, profitability of banks uh, is too low and uh, the capital price of banks in Europe are very low. Then it's a huge paradox. We are more solid and in the same time, uh, we have major structural problem. Then how in this context of the crisis uh, that we, we know that we address perfectly well the adaptation of the existing regulation to the liquidity risk now we'll be uh, facing a solvency risk uh, from um, all the different uh, enterprises where we we fulfill we, we that we finance but how in this context we can address also those structural uh, situation that uh, are conditions for europe uh, to maintain a competition and uh, and future uh, growth addressing the digital uh, and uh, environmental extremely high need of capital then uh, jose manuel uh, will be very interested to hear uh, especially because you you have a background of a politicians of a banker and now a regulation that you have the overall uh, vision about uh, all the different facets of our constraints Jose Manuel, uh, thank you to share with us this morning your views. You have the floor. I have the floor. Uh, yeah. Well, I just would like to to tell people that um, Mr. Campa will will be uh, speaking for uh, approximately twenty to twenty five minutes, and then we will have a Q and A session for about one hour. Um, you may uh, ask questions through the, the chat here, uh, write a question that we will relay to Mr. Kampa. You may write it in French or English, and, uh, and Mr. Kampa will, uh, will uh, answer the questions uh, after he has been uh, delivering uh, his address to the, to the audience for uh, this, uh, the next uh, 20 to 25 minutes. Okay, Mr. Kampa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, first of all, to everybody. Uh, double thanks. Thanks for the, to the European <laughs> Institute for Financial Regulation for having me today and inviting me to be with you. Uh, I'm really looking forward to our dialogue today. Second, also, thank you for agreeing to have this session in English. I understand that, uh, Laura, you have them in French. I wish I could have it in French, but not yet. I'm hoping it will be sometime soon. So as, as discussed already, you know, I'd like to, to talk a little bit about uh, what has been quite a challenging year, which is 2020, you know, the, the unprecedented circumstances that we are confronted with uh, have been compared to war times sometimes. You know, I don't know whether this is the case. Uh, we have been lucky enough to experience a long period of peace in Europe my lifetime and I really hope it continues that way and certainly the coronavirus is being a challenging situation. This has put limits to our organizations, to us as professionals and as individuals. We all have been tested in this very uh, challenging time. You know, we have gradually adapted to the new conditions and know better how to mitigate the risks compared to the beginning of the pandemic. But I would say that still we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. You know, and as we are now entering what looks like a, a second wave of the pandemic, I think this is true for our health systems, but it's also true for our economies. And I think it will also be for our banks, because they will go into a different phase. Uh, economic activity has been brought to a sudden freeze in the spring. Uh, GDP across Europe and across the world dropped to very uh, high levels, I would say to, to un unseen levels before. And the perspective, I think, going forward remains uncertainty, uncertain, both at the European Union and at the global level. Uh, the magnitude of this crisis, uh, particularly into the, into the economy and to the banking sector in the coming quarters, will depend still to a large, to large degree on how successful we'll be limiting, in limiting contagion in the health part, 
and also on the effects of the actions taken to support the economy. So we're still in a very uncertain path towards what I would call recovery of our economies. Now, banks, I think, have an important role to play in supporting the economy. I think they've been up. Uh, we, as, as European Union regulatory and supervisory authorities, also have a job to do, and I think we have been uh, demonstrating an unprecedented capacity to act in a, in a more homogeneous, harmonized, and resolute and effective manner than in the past, and that's good. Uh, we at the EBA, the European Banking Authority, have been working very closely in cooperation with the other European supervisory authorities, mainly the ESPA and the IOPA, but also with the ECB, both on the monetary side and the banking supervision side, and with the European Commission to try to coordinate those actions. Now, what I would like to talk today to you is first a little bit about how I see the situation of the banking industry that was already quickly described and some of these paradoxes that we have on the structural challenges in the industry going forward. Second, a quick brief summary of the regulatory reform that we have uh, put in place uh, to, to address the crisis. And then third, and, and although early, I think it's a good opportunity to raise some potential lessons learned and things that we need to work on as we go forward. So let me first spend a few minutes on the situation of the banking industry and how they manage uh, the last six months through the COVID, COVID crisis. You know, as you know, the, the banks entered the COVID epidemics in a better shape than they did in the previous crisis 10 years ago, the global financial crisis, particularly with, uh, or so already been said, with larger capital levels and abundant liquidity buffers. In December 2019, the common equity tier one average of the industry in Europe was about 15%, and it has remained stable for the first two quarters of 2020. This implies that the management buffer that banks had, which is the additional capital on top that they hold in, in excess of the capital requirements, was around 300 basis points of RWAs uh, on average in the system. On top of that, the release of some macroprudential buffers and other supervisory measures, as well as the uh, capital retention by banks, uh, provide additional uh, b buffer to the banks. As a result, in the, similarly, in the area of liquidity, buffers were also ample, with a liquidity coverage ratio of about 150% at the beginning of the country crisis. Banks' funding mix was also more balanced and stable, with a steady increase over time of the share of households and non-financial corporations' deposits since a decade ago. And banks additionally benefit from favorable conditions in wholesale funding markets in the last few quarters and also from exceptional measures from the central banks. Now, this strong capitalization and liquidity profile of the banks, you know, coupled with the response that I just mentioned of regulators and supervisors as well as monetary authorities, have enabled European banks, I think, to cope with the immediate effects of the crisis well, while supporting their customers and the government's efforts to boost liquidity into the system in a proper manner. Additionally, on the operational side, not on the capital and liquidity, but the operational, I think that the digitalization efforts and the investments that they have made over the past few years proved helpful to deal with a sudden move to remote working. Banks actually demonstrated operational resilience and the ability to operate largely with remote staff and a small physical presence, even in all core business areas. And I must say, this is, this is a reflection that applies not just to banks, but I think to the overall of the financial industry. We have seen... Uh, what looks to me uh, as very significant operational resilience under very demanding situations. Now, notwithstanding this progress, as I was as it was mentioned at the introduction, you know there are vulnerabilities in the EU banking sector, and those vulnerabilities, I think, they're likely to be exacerbated as a result of the pandemics. Some of these vulnerabilities are legally legacy from the great financial crisis, but are also determined by the lack of systemic structural reforms in the sector uh, since then. I'll give you an example. You know, there's been a lot of progress, you know, and that has to be acknowledged uh, by banks in repairing their balance sheets and improve asset quality over the last few years. That across the union, banks are without doubt now in a much better place than they were four or five years ago. The NPL ratio volume, uh, the, the NPL ratio has half, and the volume, both volume and ratio, has half since 2014. Okay. Uh, however, uh, I must say that now with the benefit of hindsight that we're back into another economic economic recession, you know, that adjustment could have been faster, particularly in certain parts of the union where the ratio remains stubbornly high. 
uh, you know, uh, some of those countries still have MPL ratios that are above the pre-2008 level of MPLs, and these are likely to increase as a result of the actual recession that we're going through right now. Uh, we did a sensitivity analysis on the situation of the banks uh, in the spring, and according to our sensitivity analysis, you know, the impact, as the, the impact of COVID-19, this is uh, a very, obviously, uh, uh, speculative exercise that we did, so I will be very cautious in, in, in finding too much on this, but it's just an example of the amount of robustness of, of the sector. You know, uh, we think that uh, stage three assets could increase to levels comparable to 2014 after the global financial crisis, and that will imply a loss in, you know, a decline in core equity tier one ratios with the decrease in NPS and increase in provisions of the range of 230 to 380 basis points of RWAs, which is within the management buffers that I mentioned before on average for the system. You have to, as I say, we have to be careful in interpreting these results. Also, because of course I'm talking about average, and there's a distribution around that average. And what matters is not just the average, but the, that every bank is able to manage this in a proper manner, or if not, able to find a way out of a situation. Uh, nevertheless, this requires monitoring, and as we go forward, and as was already mentioned, it's likely, and we're certainly going to see that the ratio of non-performing loans will increase. And it will increase, obviously, in those banks and in those sectors that have been most hit by the economy. Uh, we know that there are certain sectors in the economy that have been particularly hit. So this is an area in which we'll continue to monitor. And as we go forward, I think we'll have to continue to think about ways to manage that increase in MPLs in the banking sector. My second concern, which was mentioned also, was is profitability. Profitability, as it was mentioned, has never really recovered since the last financial crisis. Profitability levels last year, prior to the COVID crisis, uh, remain low, partially due to low interest rate margins, partially also due to the challenges in reducing costs by banks. Also, volumes of banking activity have not particularly increased overall. You know, so the the result of all this is that the return on equity does not cover the cost of equity on average for the industry in Europe, and this is a challenge. Now, as we look forward. Pressure on interest rate margins will not go away anytime soon, but will likely continue. I already mentioned the increase in likely MPLs. So the challenges in profitability, my sense is that it's expected to continue longer. And here, I think that the, the need for structural adjustment and the continued adjustment of the industry uh, remains a challenge. Let me quickly now talk a little bit about the regulatory response. I think that the, the response of the regulatory and supervisory authorities was uh, relatively quick, I would say, uh, assertive. and uh, It was making the uh, reaction effective from the outset of the crisis and helping the banks manage the, the more difficult periods. Uh, first, uh, the regulators provided operational relief to banks, you know, allowing them to shift or forecast resources where they were mostly needed, i.e. To, to manage the crisis situation. In our case, uh, the most obvious decision is we postponed the EU-wide stress test that we were in the middle of running in the spring of last year, uh, we, are des we decided to postpone it by a year. We will start running them starting in January until June of next year, and I hope that that will be a good exercise that will help banks and supervisors in better clarify their situation and their, their managing of the crisis and potentially also their way out going forward. I think this was the right thing, that we postponed the stress test at the time, but it was not an easy thing to set to do because, of course, when, when you're in a situation of crisis, what you would like to know is about the robustness of institutions to vulnerabilities. We provided additional operational relief in the area of the stopping some data reporting requirements and also some non-essential super recommending non-essential supervisory activities that they should be stopped. <coughs> Excuse me. Also, we also took into account that you know. Uh, as the crisis led to a much more reliance on digital operations, you know, there were certain areas at certain risks that were likely to be increased. And we highlighted the emphasis that banks needed to put on those risk areas, particularly in the areas of ICT, cyber risk, security risk, but also in areas of consumer conduct as they were engaging to a lot of re with a lot of reprofiling of their customers, and also in the areas of anti-money laundering and crime prevention. <coughs> 
Second aspect was on capital. You know, the capital, we, we, we provided regulatory guidance and interpretation on the flexibility in the regulation. And we reminded that, you know, capital and liquidity buffers were there in the regulation, uh, were there also in the regulation to be used in situations of need. And this was a situation of need. So we encouraged the use of those buffers. In the same line, macro prudential authorities across the European Union uh, release their macro potential buffers. Uh, I think the, the supervisors, particularly the SSM, also uh, gave clear indications that banks could operate below their P2G, their Pillar 2 guidance. As I mentioned, also banks helped also by providing uh, restrictions on dividend payments and other capital payments to investors, and that contributed to about 40 billion euros to, of capital that remain in the system. I realized that this was a controversial measure at the time, and a few stakeholders have argued against it, criticizing the blanket approach that was taken to the dividend distribution policy. However, I think also that a system-wide approach was proportionate at the time when there were like very, very I would call system-wide measures, including full confinement of the population that were taken as a measure to the crisis in a situation in which there was a very, very uh, large degrees of uncertainty. It's obvious that in a normal situation, a case-by-case -case approach is the appropriate way to pursue, to, to pursue these policies and the conversation between supervisors and banks should be the driving force on capital proje projections and distributions by banks. And I'm sure that that will be uh, what we will return to in the medium term as we address the recovery stage. Uh, <coughs> as you know, these capital measures had the objective to enhance banks' ability to finance the economy and also create hard room for lending. I think that has happened overall. You know, uh, the overall freed up of capital was 110 basis points, which added to the management buffers and the P2G. So there was a total cushion of 500 basis points of capital across the system to the use of this. We have seen actually that loans have increased, credit lines have increased in the areas as we expected. So we think that uh, that has worked very well, similar, by the way, to the liquidity measures. Finally, beyond, beyond capital and liquidity, you know, I think we also provided some guidance on the use of moratoria, particularly and the, and the application of generalized payment moratoria in the application of the regulation in the areas of foreborn assets and IFRS 9 calculations. And here the, the key component was that the, the Regulation did not imply any automaticity, but rather the banks needed to do an assessment on a, on a guide on a case by case basis to make sure that whatever the uh, moratoria provided were the characteristics as well as what were the outstanding and the remaining credit quality and credit assessment of the counterparty. And that assessment needed to do, be done on a case by case basis. We realized that early in the crisis, when there were hundreds and millions, hundreds of thousands and millions. Of, more, of, of individuals, corporates, and citizens that were subject to these moratorias or to this reprofiling to do this on a case-by-case -case basis was uh, impossible. So we provided some uh, guidance there uh, until September, until last week. Uh, but now that the situation has more or less uh, become normalized in the sense that banks are able to engage in individual transactions, we think it's time for the banks to do a proper assessment of the individual situation. That's why these deadlines have expired at the end of September. Finally, you know, um, we provided some more uh, pragmatic approach on other supervisory policies, particularly the assessment of the of the SREP for 2020, you know, recommending authorities to focus only on the material risk and vulnerabilities that were driven by the crisis, so as to also reduce the burden on banks on, on this on the supervisory process and evaluation. The rationale of the package of measures that we put forward is clear. It's to safeguard business continuity in the sector, allow banks to use the capital and liquidity buffers and remove and any unintended obstacles to the widespread use of the public support measures. At the same time, there were regulatory changes to support in this area that you're very much aware of, the quick fees of the CRR, also the announcement by at the international level through good collaboration that uh, the Basel, the implementation, the final phase of the implementation of Basel III will be, will be postponed for, for a year. I think all those measures have helped, you know, to provide an environment in which banks were able to properly address the challenges produced by the by the crisis. As we go forward, you know, it's important that we continue to do a proper assessment 
of the situation of the banks and the banks do a proper assessment of their risk situation of their counterparties. That's why we have introduced some additional reporting requirements, particularly uh, to have more clarity on the prevalence within the banking sector and within the portfolios of banks of the measures that have been put forward to deal with the crisis, particularly in the area of, as I mentioned before, moratoria and the use of public guarantee schemes, the different public guarantee schemes that were uh, approved and put in place by governments across the union. Let me dedicate the last five minutes of my intervention to talk a little bit about lessons learned so far from this experience, particularly, obviously, within the banking sector and within the regulatory framework of the, of, of, in which banks operate. This is uh, maybe seem a little premature. Uh, we're obviously in the midst of the crisis, as I said at the beginning. We have a lot of uncertainty about how the crisis will evolve and still going forward. But all crises are different, and at the same time, they all share a common out outcome. You know, uh, this one obviously was very different for the global financial crisis. But you know, early on, I'll give you an example. Early on, the immediate reaction remain still at national level, particularly in the area of moratoria, public guarantee schemes. Some of them were even at the sub-national level with private initiatives, generalized moratoria, or also with public guarantee schemes that were differed by state, uh, by, sorry, by sector or by uh, individual citizens within the, uh, within the country, depending on their individual situation, whether they were self-employed or low-income households or similar vulnerable uh, groups. Now, uh, this is understandable, you know, because there was an urgency and we need to, uh, governments and, and institutions need to act and there are a lot of time pressure and uncertainty. But at the same time, it's far from optimal as we think uh, as, uh, of the level playing field, as we think of the single market with the European Union and the world function of the single market. So this crisis, you know, with the payment moratoria, the public guarantee schemes, uh, launched at national levels, you know, we need to continue to make sure and be vigilant to uh, preserve the single market. Our guidelines uh, that I mentioned before try to provide a harmonized framework for the potential treatment of such measures. I think that that's working, but that's still work in progress at this stage as, as uh, supervisors are assessing each one of these different moratoria and public guarantee schemes and the implications for the, for the regulatory treatment of the guarantees and clarity is being provided by bank, to banks and also to, to stakeholders. Now, on the positive side, I think that the overall regulatory reforms and the agreed both at first at the global level in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, but also part of the uh, institutional infrastructure that was put in place after the global financial crisis, partially in Europe, mainly I'm thinking about the banking union and the, the ESRB and, and the ESAS, obviously uh, here, uh, me as, as chairman of the EBA, one of the European supervisory authorities, I realized that I'm part of that process, so I may be biased. But I would say that overall, you know, we can, uh, we can reassure citizens that the overall infrastructure has worked as it was planned, and it has helped manage the crisis in a much better way than uh, it was done in 20, 2009. In fact, you know, had this crisis hit the banking sector of Europe in 2009 or even in 2014, you know, where the build-up of the balance sheets of banks was much quicker at the time, and also the infrastructure, institutional infrastructure at the European level was not there, I think that... Uh, Today we'll be discussing how banks could contribute to the report. Instead of today being discussing how banks could contribute to the recovery, excuse me, I think we'll probably be discussing how to maybe avoid a potential financial crisis again. Now, in general, high, high capital, upper liquidity, better asset quality, better digital capacity, and stronger risk management in banks, all this has helped to respond to the, to the emergency. This all confirms to me the importance of a sound regulatory framework and its effective implementation. Now, I think that uh, <coughs> the Basel III framework overall has been proven to be uh, overall well resilient and well placed, not too uh, pro cyclical at this stage, you know, but rather has allowed the flexibility to act as a stabilizer rather than amplifier of shocks, which was the very, the, I think, the very purpose of the regulation when put in place through the last decade. However, this doesn't mean that it works perfectly. And I think we're learning over the last six months that despite the uh, re 
release of capital buffers and the encouragement by, by authorities to use these buffers by banks. Banks seem to be unwilling to use the release buffers. And in, indeed, until the second quarter of last year, of this year, we have, which, well, this is the period for which we have information, we have not seen a significant decrease on the core equity tier one ratio of banks. Uh, there are several reasons why this might happen, this reluctance of banks to use the buffers. One could be market stigma associated with the use of buffers or even with a simple decline of capital ratios, not even, not even digging into the buffers. Um, also, it may indicate the reluctance of market participants to accept fluctuations of buffers as, as a cyclical component of the capital requirement regulation. Could be also linked to the way that these buffers work and they interplay with each other. The regulation of this aspect is complex, and um, I'm aware of this. The interaction between the capital buffers and the leverage buffer on one side, the capital buffer and the embryo, TLAC requirements on the other, the different buffers within the capital uh, stacking, uh, the counter cyclical capital buffer versus the capital conservation buffer. These are all areas in which I think we're learning that uh, there may be some uh, thought process that needs to go into it to make sure that there is a proper use through the cycle of all these buffers in the manner in which they were thought. Some of them were thought to be more macro-oriented buffers to, to deal with more macro shocks like the one we're confronted now. Other ones are more micro-oriented to deal with bank-specific shocks. That's why we need to have more clarity on when would this should be used or not. <coughs> Of course, banks are also, and they, they, we hear this message all the time, they're reluctant to use the structural buffers because they may undermine the ability to pay out dividends and coupons. They're also re reluctant to use them because they think they may not have enough clarity of what would be the timing for rebuilding these buffers over time and what would be the implications if that rebuilding of the buffers had, is not done uh, with sufficient time. So this is an area which I think over the medium term Basel will have to work on it and we'll have to reflect a little bit more on this area. Let me conclude. I realize I'm running out of time, you know, very quickly. Uh, as I said, you know, the, crisis, the crisis triggered by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, put our reforms that were put in place in the global financial crisis to test. This was a real-life stress test of the system, not just of the banks, but also the regulatory reform. Uh, with the evolution of the pandemic still unclear, and the short and long term conference consequence, I think, is unwise at this stage to draw conclusions. But let me just give you an impression. It's not a conclusion, which is that the philosophy behind the post global financial crisis regulation, mainly more demanding requirements in normal times that can be relaxed in bad times, has been successful so far. Doesn't mean that there are not aspects that uh, may require a critical review, as I was just mentioning. But I would advocate taking time to reflect and discuss and make decisions about those adjustments, you know, because changing the rules while the crisis is ongoing would be premature, imprudent, and also could be interpreted as a sign of weakness of the sector, which I think will be not good for the sector. Second impression, you know, the, EU bank, the, the, the banking sector in the EU has been resilient so far, but challenges have remained, mainly in the areas I mentioned before, MPLs. Uh, they need to be sure banks that they're assessing risk properly throughout this period. As I mentioned before, I hope that our 2021 EU-wide stress test will allow us to better assess the consequences of the crisis on banks with a better outlook, hopefully, also on the future, on the economic developments in the future, and at the same time start discussing possible, if, if, if the timing is right, exit strategies or supervisory expectations on capital planning going forward. As I said, so far, our, our, sector, our analysis indicates that the sector is resilient, but nevertheless, I think it's important that uh, the structural challenges that were identified uh, in the banking sector prior to the crisis, mainly profitability, high cost structure, need to restructure the cost, need for a technological transformation into the new business models more linked to the use of digitalization and uh, and information technologies, third, excess capacity in the industry. None of those challenges have gone away, but on the contrary, they have become even probably more pressing and they have accelerated as, as a structural challenges. Profitability is continuing to be more of a challenge as we go forward. The technological transformation of the industry is, if anything, accelerating as a result of the COVID and as we're all engaging in 
obviously distance working and distance uh, I would say distance working and distance leisure both you know and third the aspect on the need to work on the cost structure of banks on uh, assuring that there are sustainable business models going forward and manage with the perceived excess capacity in certain parts of the system I think that those are structural challenges that remain we're seeing banks already uh, confronting them, addressing them, and I think that we need to continue that in the future if we want to assure that we have a robust banking sector going forward, a banking sector that's able to support uh, the industry going forward and also growth in the European economy. Let me stop here. I did not on purpose uh, refer to any of the other challenges that we have, particularly I will mention the ESG components but I'm happy to discuss those uh, in the conversation that follows. Thank you very much again for having me with you today. It's really uh, not very for me. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, very complete uh, uh, analysis and observation. Um, uh, I will stop there and give um, uh, the floor for questions. Um, Michel, would you organize those uh, questions? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, I will uh, relay uh, the questions that uh, appear uh, here that uh, I can read because, uh, well, most people can see the, those questions, but uh, maybe people that are on the phone can cannot see them. So I'm going to read them, starting with uh, a question from uh, Françoise Balguillabert. Uh, Françoise uh, Balguillaber is the managing director of the Association of Finance Companies, meaning companies involved in uh, specialized lending. And the question is about, uh, I guess, uh, proportionality. Uh, it says, considering the guidelines on loan origination, specialized credit business models structur structurally cannot fit with some requirements. Uh, like uh, consumer credit at the point of sale, factoring for uh, SMEs, leasing via vendors. How could they appreciate the proportionality principle of paragraph 16? I, I, I must admit I'm not familiar with paragraph 16. So uh, I don't know. Maybe Celia, could you, could you give the, the, could you give the, uh, micro to oh, Francoise? Who could uh, who could maybe express uh, her question more uh, clearly than I did? Hop, je viens de je viens de donner la main, mais okay. But anyway, no. Faut attendre, je je sais pas. Okay. Okay, well, anyway, the question is about, well, EBA has been publishing recently some uh, guidelines on origination, but it, it clearly doesn't. Fit of oh, uh, here yeah. you are, Francoise. Hi, thank you very much for uh, for uh, giving me the floor. Um, my question is related to specialized financial activities, as the EBA guidelines may be dedicated from uh, classical banking loans, and we have some difficulties with uh, some specialized activities such as consumer credit at the point of sale. Uh, factoring for SMEs and uh, leasing via vendors programs. And my question is, uh, how could they manage the proportionality principle, which is very general at the beginning of the guidelines and um, must be combined with all the very precise and specific and detailed requirement uh, for for granting a loan. Okay. May I? Yeah. Yeah. Please. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for the question. I mean, this is, uh, as you mentioned, these guidelines on loan origination, an important project that we have put forward. Uh, the goal here of the guidelines is to make sure that banks, at the time of originating a loan, engage in the uh, so what I will call I, I'm not going to call it due diligence, but then. In, in, engage in a proper assessment of what they think, you know, the credit conditions of the provision of that loan to the customer involved. Mm. So, and that, that goes from, I would say, having some AML aspects, for instance, on the very extreme, and it's part of the novelty, you know, making sure that you're providing, engaging with a customer in which you don't have AML concerns to the traditional, you know, credit assessment. 
of, of the of the credit quality of, of the person. Now I realize that we, we have we have been hearing from from some of your colleagues, you know, as well that that for some uh, special lending activities like like leasing, the point of credit uh, in consumer finance, some of those challenges are there. It's also true that the capillarity of many of those, but particularly in the consumer credit, the capillarity of those operations, which tend to be relatively small of high volume, you know, require systems that are more on automatic scoring or things of that sort or modeling modeling approaches rather than a case by case approach. So that's the sense in which I think that the proportionality principle could be applied. You know, and we have been clear, I think, in that aspect that, you know, the provision, the low originations do not in any mean uh, do not uh, impede uh, banks or special lending of uh, entities to go through automatic scoring models in which they, they classify uh, customers in an automatic manner rather than individual space, and that will be in line with the long origination. So I hope that will be some of the areas you know in which you're referring to. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly specifically, obviously there are many different kinds of operations that fall within, within the categories that you mentioned, from specialized lending to to retail. But I hope that those, uh, as, as you said, th those provisions in the general principle of proportionality provide sufficient room for maneuvering, so to make sure that you are able to operate your business while preserving the principles and the, and the overall objectives of the of the guidelines, which is to make sure that at the time of originating a loan, you're doing a proper and proportional risk assessment of the implications of that loan through the life of the loan. You. Okay, uh, yeah. Francois, so you, you had the second question about uh, CMU. Uh, you may take the opportunity to, to raise it now. Oh, no, it's not you. Uh, no, it's, uh, no, no, not okay, you. I'm sorry about that. Thank you. Thank but you very much. Introduce, you can introduce this question anyway. Yeah, so there is a question about uh, what is the, well, it's a global general question. What about the CMU's impact on banks? And uh, with a second que implicit question, is securitization a credible tool to reduce NPL ratios? Yes, uh, th thank you for the question. I'll start with the second part, uh, and then I'll come back to the first part, because the second part is a clear I think, example of the first aspect. I do think, and I agree with, with, the, with the gist of the question, I think securitization is one of the crucial tools on the program. It's not the only one, but it's one of the tools to help banks, uh, not just for MPLs, but in general to help banks uh, move assets out of their balance sheet and maybe rotate portfolio in a faster manner and have a, a business model that allows them to generate more revenue. But particularly in the area of MPLs, it's the thing which we need to work. It's been a paradox over the last decade you know, that the securitization industry in Europe never really took off after the global financial crisis, never recovered in a significant manner well, in other parts of the world, particularly in the US, it did. So I do think that this is an area which we've been pushing very much at the EBA and working with the Commission, that, you know, working on the regulatory framework for securitizations, not just with NPS, I mentioned, but in general, the securitization framework. Uh, it's an area in which we need to go forward. And for me, that's an important component of the Capital Markets Union. And it's also an example, as I mentioned, of how the Capital Markets Union and the development of capital markets in Europe will be a strong complement to banks, complement in the activity that they do, complement in the range of activities that they do, but also complements in helping them manage better their uh, existing portfolios, particularly their loan portfolios, as I mentioned at the beginning. So I hope that the capital market union continues to go forward, to be honest. I think that that will help tremendously uh, for us to provide an additional, more effective source of funding that go into the, into the the, the European economy, part of it will go through capital markets, but part of it will be rechanneling of either of, of currently bank lending that's going to go through capital markets or just, as I mentioned before, you know, a channeling of credit that was originally provided by the bank markets that then is treated within the parts of the financial industry. Okay. Um, then there is a question by Bernard Coupé. Uh, Bernard is a uh, managing director for CFA Institute of France. Bernard, as I see you on the screen, you, you may raise your question. Yes, um, thank you. Um, thank you, Michel. Uh, well, uh, it's a pleasure to see you again, uh, Mr. Campa. Uh, I have a question about <coughs> um, a paper published <coughs> some days ago by the European Commission about uh, 
um, digital finance, um, and particularly about uh, crypto assets. And in this paper, uh, it is included that uh, the supervision of platform by um, uh, platform by uh, organized at Europe and level should be under the uh, supervision of the EBA when the size uh, justified it. And I would like to, to know that um, how you will organize this activity, of course, a new one and of course, a marginal one, uh, and how you will implement and organize this activity when the text will be will have been approved by the European Commission and uh, by the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers. Thank you, Mr. Kampa. Yeah, no, thank you, Bernard. Thank you for the question. I mean, uh, as, as you're very well informed, obviously, and, and this is a relatively recent news. So first of all, is at this stage, it's just, it's just a proposal. It's a legislative proposal from the Commission. So for us, we need to, we need to have, uh, obviously, the, the approval of the co-legislators. So I need to be a, a rule to be able to implement it. We are expecting that this come into implementation for us probably 2022, 2023. But as you mentioned there, I think the important part here, uh, and we're happy about this, this overall uh, digital strategy of the Commission because it covers areas in which we saw there were existing weaknesses in the regulation covering this, some of these crypto assets in particular. There's another one on operational resilience as well, you know, the DORA initiative. But on the crypto assets, as you mentioned, you know, there's a provision there that for significant crypto assets, and the definition of significant crypto assets is still to be determined. We don't have clarity. Uh, but the, the, the expectation is, as you mentioned, also that it should be like large or pan-European crypto mm -hmm. assets that are expected to be used relatively widely across the, across more than one country in the Union. There will be a supervisory obligation for us. You know, uh, we will have to build. Uh, you mentioned you said that it was a marginal activity for the ABA. I would say uh, it may be marginal, but it's very important. And more important, uh, the challenge for us in this area at this stage is that you know this is a new area, so we don't know how many of those significant crypto assets there may be in the European Union in four or five years. I can more or less predict how many banks the European Union will have in five years or in 10 years, because we're, we're talking about an established mature industry. But this is a, a new industry with no, so I don't know if there, I mean, we know that there is a, a clear, obviously, proposal, private proposal initiative that has been talked about for a year, which is Libra. No, but there may be many others that may arise. So I don't have a sense at this stage of what will be the volume. Are we talking about a handful of significant crypto assets or are we talking about ten tens of them? I, it's, it's too early to judge. But we'll have to build capabilities. You know, the, the Commission has, has put forward a proposal of, of not only of how that will will be the competence, but also how it will be funded. It's supposed to be with like most supervisory activities to reduce the funding by contribution of the supervisees. No, but it's something that at this stage we're expecting will be about 10, 15% of our organization early on, and then we'll see. Thank you. Yep. Um, a question by Emmanuel Rondeau, uh, who is a, a non-executive director of uh, La Banque Postale, uh, which says, you highlighted the way regulation has significantly... Oh, Emmanuel, you are there. You, you may raise yourself as a question. Yes, uh, thank you, Michel, and uh, thank you very much, Jose Manuel, for this very insightful presentation. Uh, yeah, as you said, it's a little bit early to, to draw lessons from the crisis. Uh, we have many things going on still. But uh, uh, there were two aspects of the regulatory framework. I wanted to know whether you could share any any view from uh, from lessons learned from this crisis, which are number one, the uh, all, all the uh, the EBA uh, guidelines on on governance and and how you have seen banks. Um, playing with with governance properly through the crisis, and and the second one being the stress testing exercise. We uh, you have postponed to next year the uh, the stress testing exercise. But what what, it, what the crisis tells us about uh, the past uh, stress test exercises? Thank you very much. Thank you. First, on the, in the issue of governance, as, as you may be aware, we're in the process of, of revising actually our guidelines on governance. Well, I think this is an important aspect. Uh, there, I, I think there are like two messages for us. You know, uh, we've always, as, as you know, this has been a, a dear area of the ABA. You know, the fact that there should be proper governance institutions and tone from the top and culture. I think there is a fair amount of, of progress that has been made, but the progress remains uneven. 
you know, and I think that there needs to be a continued push in the area of enhancing the governance of the institutions. More, <coughs> more, more important, if I go forward, on the implementation of the governance, uh, there seems to be a fair amount of, uh, how do I say this, a fair amount of, I don't know if heterogeneity of difficulty, for instance, in the place of fit and proper procedures. Fit and proper procedures across the union are, are very burdensome sometimes, questionable, they're not transferable. You know, if, if you are declared to be fit and proper by one national authority or by one authority in one area, you cannot use that procedure to, to be considered fit and proper in another jurisdiction within the union. That should be, I think, more streamlined, for instance. Second aspect there, also, I think we need to take into account other aspects in the fit and proper process. I already mentioned the law of origination, AML, for instance, well, AML considerations as well, you know, whether the person has been engaged on on suspicious activities of the range or not, that's an aspect. And then on the area of governance, I think there's also a second part of the crisis that has become more important, and I mentioned at the end of my conversation, my presentation, which was the ESG, ESG considerations of broader objectives of, of the firm. And I think that's we go forward, that should be an area that to be worked on. Second aspect on the stress test. The stress test, I, I think they have proven to be a good supervisory tool, you know, and the, the stress test we have been using have been uh, very focused on uh, macro, uh, macroeconomic uh, shocks, downturns to the macroeconomy, and how those affect solvency. I think this crisis actually has shown us that other areas of stress are also important. Important operational resilience, for instance, you know, and this actually we we just went through a stress test on operational resilience that that was a real stress test in real life that had you asked me at the beginning of this year, do you think the financial sector is in a condition to move overnight to 100% teleworking? I would probably have answered you, I, 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 I mean, I don't know, but I don't think so. I hope we don't have to do it. Well, they did it. And we all did it and it was able to work. So for me, that was, and we have not tested at that level operational resilience, you know, and that's one area we probably need to go forward. So, uh, testing those parts. You know, sustainability is also another part of, of the agenda. For us, more important going forward, there are uh, two aspects of the stress test that are uh, important. One is the short term. As I mentioned, next year's stress test should be able to help us to better plan at the bank specific level how we're going to phase out of this crisis. You know, I hope that by June of next year, when we publish the results, we'll have a better outlook on what the economic recovery looks like. You know, whether there was a second wave, not a second wave, maybe we already have vaccines, but the health crisis hopefully will be behind us. It'll be more about the economic recovery. So how banks are going to deal with that economic recovery. And then the second aspect for me, which is, uh, you may be aware, but we've been engaging in a discussion on a long-term discussion of, a st of the future of a stress test. Here for me, I think we need to, find a balance between the stress test being uh, a good tool to multiple goals, which is always difficult because if you have one tool with multiple goals, you cannot achieve them. But one goal is providing information to stakeholders, and that's external stakeholders primarily. That has been very, very useful. Second aspect is enhance the conversation between banks and supervisors. You know, and how they are, how they see the bank and what are the levers that need to be activated to enhance the bank and their sustainability going forward. And third, on the capital, on the capital expectations of the bank, you know, that there should be information about what is the expectation of the supervisor on what the situation of the bank is in terms of capital distributions going forward. And I think those are the three areas that we need to work as we get in, in the discussion of the long term stress test. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, if I um, may uh, intervene here, uh, we already had um, a kind of a seminar at, uh, with EBA and some banks on this issue. And I think it's uh, structurally uh, very, very important. And your predecessor in his testament uh, tried to drive uh, some vision to adapt a stress test uh, to uh, the dual risk management approach, meaning how to align the stress testing structural construction with um, this dual need of uh, using the result of the stress test in the same time for uh, regulatory purposes and supervisory purposes, but in the same time to use it, use it for internal risk uh, allocation of capital. And um, I, I understand that this dual goal is very complex, uh, 
But if we use the stress test just for macro and not link it for a micro uh, uh, leverage of the result, it's a gap. Also, the second problem is uh, the stability of the rule of the stress test from one stress test to the other. Uh, each time, it's a huge mobilization of energy and cost to address the stress test in, um, in, in an approach which is um, not stabilized. And, and that is complex. The, the, the stabilization process is an issue at pan-European level. But also, there is an interaction between the stress test and the need of national supervisors. Uh, and the complexity of this construction um, is, is a major problem. This complexity, the cost, and an inability to really express to uh, analysis or the investor use of the result is also a, a major problem. They understand that... Uh, there is a huge work which is done more or less today to be sure that the next stress test operation will address more uh, those uh, constraints. Uh, uh, are we going in this direction? Is uh, the new approach of the stress test addressing part of those constraints yet or not? Uh, I hope so. I mean, we're in the discussion. We just finished the consultation. We put up a discussion paper at the beginning of the year, and we finished the consultation at the end of August. The discussion paper had, as, as you suggested, this, this uh, proposal of having two legs, a supervisory leg and a bank leg, you know, as one of these trust tests, the supervisory leg that will lead to supervisory decisions, uh, the bank leg or the bank outcome that will be more useful for internal analysis. The feedback that we got from the industry was uh, from stakeholders was very skeptical of having these two different visions. They mm -hmm. thought that it was better to have a single vision, you know, uh, and that vision was uh, probably agreed between the, the supervisor and the bank. Of course, from the bank's participant, they must rather have a, a higher weight on the bank's vision. From the supervisor's uh, point of view, they rather have a higher weight on the supervisor's vision. Mm -hmm. But there was consensus that it was better to have an, an, a single agreement. And that that conversation, although difficult at times, as you mentioned, you know, between the, the bank and the and the supervisor, they actually find it more useful than despite, despite the difficulties. The second aspect of which I think we're working, as you said, is on the burdensome, the amount of work and, and requirements that, that takes from banks and supervisors in engaging in the stress tests. And here we're, we're working on, on the different proposals and different alternatives. We don't have clarity yet, but they will involve in some idea of maybe relaxing some of the assumptions of the methodology or imposing some proportionality principles, depending on either uh, objective uh, views of, of how the starting position of the, of the internal assessment of banks works or observable, observable positions on the risk profile of the banks. But it's a discussion that is now ongoing. We just had a, a first reflection from the from the feedback from the consultation in our board uh, two weeks ago, and we expect to continue on this. It will not be for the 2021 stress test exercise. It will be for future stress tests. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, there is um, another question from uh, Francoise uh, Paul Guillabert uh, about uh, which says some requirements of the EBA guidelines on loan origination go further than some national law requirements. Uh, Francoise, go, go ahead, please. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm afraid it's a second question on the guidelines on the loan uh, origination and I money. I cannot hear you, Francoise. I'm not sure if I'm the only one that cannot hear you. Uh, we can hear Francoise. Uh, try again, Francoise, please. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I have a second question. Okay, now. No, no, no I have difficulties hearing her. I can okay. hear you well, Michelle, but I cannot hear from you. Okay, but uh, so I will just relay the question, Francoise. Yes. Uh, Thank you. It says uh, some requirements of, of the EBA guidelines, again, mm -hmm. uh, on non origination go further than some national law requirements, uh, for example, in uh, consumer credit in France. How can this issue be solved with the application of uh, the proportionality principle? I, I, to be honest, I'm not familiar with the example that you're mentioning, you know, of, of requirements going beyond the specifics of, of national law in France. 
in general, in general, you know, as you know, our guidelines are for guidelines are expected for uh, banks to comply, if not to explain. And one of the arguments that has been done in the past, you know, is that particularly, if I understand correctly here, it, they go further, but they do not contradict the requirements of the national law. You know, in that case, it's for the bank to choose whether they want to, to apply with the guidelines or not, but they're not in contradiction. In other cases, in the past, in which we had actually conflicts between some national law requirements, this was obviously an argumentation that was being put forward by, by authorities and banks uh, not to comply with that specific provision or that specific guideline. You know, but I'm not familiar with the specific uh, additional requirements that you're mentioning here, Francois. If, if you want to send me an email bilaterally, I'll, I'll send it to the, to the policy experts and maybe they can respond to you more precisely. Good. Okay. okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, there are no, no other questions for the time being. Please, uh, you may raise uh, some questions. Uh, in the meantime, uh, well, I have a long list of uh, other questions uh, to you, Mr. Mr. Kompa. Um, maybe one about the uh, responsibility of the banking sector in helping uh, climate transition. Um, do you or should we expect new regulatory initiatives to incentivize banks to greening the economy? And second, um, do you think that banks are active enough in measuring the impact of climate change in their on their own books? There is a more to do in that area. Yeah, and we can add uh, all those issues uh, related with uh, uh, stressed uh, climate risk and how. The supervisor uh, could be uh, uh, concerned by by this new dimension of uh, of, of risk. Yeah, Charles. Oh, your micro. Okay. Right. Oh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. yeah. I mean myself. Uh, I would say that we published uh, late last year our ESG strategy. It's a five-year strategy, you know, and it has a number of components. But just to be relatively relatively quick on this, you know, uh, early on we think that most of the of the focus should be at this stage on assessing uh, and, and better understanding the situation of banks in terms of particularly about talking now about their climate climate risk. Uh, but the climate risk exposure, but more generally the ESG exposures. You know, this will involve, from our point of view, two aspects. One is uh, some, enha some enhanced governance at the highest level, but then in which the, the institutions set principles of what is it that they are trying to achieve on this area, how they're trying to measure it, and also some disclosure requirements, probably in the context of Pillar 3, which we'll be publishing early next, early next year. And for consultation, those disclosure requirements are going to be more principle-based rather than prescriptive, because of course, at this stage, the degree of of agreement on a single taxonomy or a single way of presenting things is not there yet in the industry. We need to work, but I think it's important the banks start talking about this issue, start disclosing uh, their existing positions. As we go forward, I think that the second challenge relies on risk measurement of this risk, how to measure this risk from both. Uh, the uh, governance perspective, the risk appetite, or where the bank wants to go in terms of how much risk they want to have of this type of portfolios, and also from the risk management, from the micro appetite, how they want to assess individual positions and then eventually uh, move from certain parts of their portfolio to other parts of their portfolio. This is an area in which for that you need to have good modeling and enhance the modeling, so banks need to start working on that part. And this is a difficult area. Because, of course, many of our models are based on historical data, uh, traditionally, uh, for the traditional risks. And this is, uh, 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 in that sense, what I would call a non-traditional risk, in which other forms of risk assessment may be necessary or complementary to just historical data. You know, whether it's, whether it's uh, scenario analysis, simulation exercises, I don't know, we can, we can, we can think of, or we'll have to think together about this. But this is uh, an agenda, well, we call a medium term agenda for 2022 and 2023, in which we expect banks to have enhanced. And then once we have enhanced risk measurement, then we can talk about uh, what you call uh, incentivized or prudential treatment, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, of, uh, of of risk. I think it will be very difficult to do any prudential treatment of risks if we don't ha of, of this risk if we don't know how to measure the risks. Mm -hmm. Because there be a, yeah. a strong contradiction. Now coming back to the question also on the stress that you know we've been engaging this year on on a in, on an analysis with a with a group of banks that have that have volunteered 
for the analysis, you know, among European banks to assess how to assess a climate related risk in the bank's portfolios. Okay. Now, this is not a stress test. We don't call it a stress test. Uh, we'll come forward with some of our conclusions early next year in a, in a report, you know, but it's, it's a way to assess, you know, how best to address the underlying risk. Of course, here there, there, there are two aspects that are fundamental. One is, you know, the, 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 the inherent risks in the climate portfolios and also the inherent regulatory challenges that some sectors may be confronted as a result of changes in climate risk regulation. Those are a bit different, different, both of them highly uncertain, you know, but I think it's important that the banks think about reassessing. I, I always like, like to, like to say that in general, you know, banks are not direct uh, generators or returns of either climate risk or climate protection. You know, they are providers of an essential uh, input for those activities that generate or deter those climates, which obviously are the productive activities. But financing itself is, I mean, we can talk, we can talk about, that, about that, the footprint mm-hmm. of, the, of the banking sector in terms of, in terms of, 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 of climate-related impact, but that's relatively minor. The important thing is the role of the, of the sector in terms of financing growth and financing of the economy. And I think that it's fundamental that the banking sector is there to properly channel finance to the future of the European economy. You know, but to properly channel finance to the future of the European economy, that implies that we need to have clarity on where the future of the European economy wants to go, and companies need to have good investment propositions in a risk-based analysis. Okay. Thank you. Um, other questions, I have one on uh, consolidation, uh, the banking consolidation, which has been made in some countries, uh, but not all of them, but certainly has not been very effective uh, for a transnational consolidation. Do you see any area where uh, uh, there, could, there certainly could be progress in that area? area? Is, can regulation foster uh, transnational uh, transnational consolidation in the banking sector is there anything to be to be done to build a, a stronger european institutions yeah i will complete uh, this question you mentioned several times that uh, we need uh, structural reforms to address uh, profitability uh, uh, capital ratios related with capital cost and so on and so on um, then one answer can be around consolidation um, but we know that there is some gaps between the need of consolidation and the regulatory constraints about uh, uh, how to perceive uh, national jurisdiction versus uh, uh, pan-european jurisdictions as a uh, uh, capital is concerned, uh, then how we can see this consolidation that uh, the ECB is, is asking for for several years already and the real uh, conditions uh, to see how critical mass is a factor to address those structural issues or not, and if it is, how the regulators uh, can help to go in that direction. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I mean, I, I do believe that you know there are structural challenges in the industry that need to be addressed. Okay, and some of those is, is cost effectiveness, as I mentioned, excess capacity in some situation, and consolidation is a way to accomplish that. You know, so but I do believe at the same time that consolidation is, is a tool that makes sense only if the resulting business model and business proposition from the consolidation is a better one than the two previous ones. You know, that's, not, that's not a guarantee just because I'm consolidating mm-hmm. the banks or I'm merging. You know, there needs, there yeah. needs to be a business case there. And I think that there is fundamental economics that the business case could be there, driven by, as I say, you know, cost efficiencies and economies of scale. Uh, it is true that uh, when we talk and when I talk to, to bankers and to industry participants, they tend to see many more benefits of that at the domestic level now than at the cross-border level. The reasons that they normally argue are, are several, but the most uh, regular ones is, well, more, is your overlap of operations that then you can consolidate, be it on the distribution networks or headquarters and back office operations, that those could be much easier consolidated in a domestic context than in an international context. 
in a cross-border context. That's one aspect. Second aspect that sometimes we hear is that lack of synergies in terms of, you know, like where we think we have a single market, but at the end of the day, as we go into certain parts of, of the banking sector, mainly more towards the retail area, you know, the synergies start to disappear. And there's not that that's such a strong synergies. That's another comment that we hear many often. Third times is difficulties in going through necessary restructuring because of of national laws, not related necessarily to fund, to banks, but maybe you know like uh, labor laws, for instance, or you know uh, <coughs> restructuring loans, insolvency procedures, things of that sort. That's another comment that we hear, and then also. You know, the, the, the challenge, as, as you mentioned, that the supervisor may put a bigger burden on the bigger entity than on the two entities being separated, a bigger regulatory burden. Sometimes we hear, obviously, the, the, you know, the too big to fail argument, the, the systemic surcharge on capital, be it because you're a global systemic institution or now become a national systemic institution. Those are all burdens, you know. So then we need to work on that direction. I think the ECB, as you mentioned, you know, has been, uh, quite actually proactive. They come forward with a paper, uh, I think it was about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, in their explanation what their approach would be to mergers, putting a lot of emphasis on the viability of the resulting entity and the business model, and that that will be the, the key assessment. Uh, I think from the European perspective, and here I am biased, you know, a cross-border merger for me will be a realization that there are synergies in cross-border activity, that the single market is operating effectively, that the supranational supervision is operating effectively, and it will be, a, a, if I might say, one of the measures of success of the banking union and the European integration. The fact that they do not exist, to me, they point that obviously the economics of having these cross-border mergers are more difficult, and that's what the bank is saying. We need to continue to work in eliminating those regulations. But I think we need to continue to work. There's uh, still home host issues within the European Union, the back regulation, you know, which uh, uh, home authorities and host authorities may be reluctant to give up uh, uh, full control over a local subsidiary that operates in, in their jurisdiction. There's many other issues linked to, as I mentioned, law, labor law, taxation, other dif differences across the Union that also make more difficult across border activity. But... It, again, it's a tool. It's a good tool to the extent that it addresses the structural problems. It's a good tool if it puts better business models going forward. But it's not uh, a goal by itself. I will say, you know, it's 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 a goal that makes sense. It's a way to achieve something. Yeah, but if we can go in this direction, um, I think uh, that we drive to another question: is how we can be less silo driven in the way we think about strategic issues and when i mean silo it means that we are touching the universal banking model in a certain way which has a, a huge uh, had been a huge debate but when we see our competitors coming from the us we saw that from the crisis they leverage significantly positively the universal banking model and it means that if we want uh, to address those structural issues, we have to think between banking union and capital market union in a more convergent way to address those issues because we saw that the force of those big American banks is the fact that they properly balance the two aspects of uh, delivering credit and addressing uh, capital market issues inside the same type of institution and doing that from the US that fragilize our model because we know that then the US banks uh, have a more uh, competitive uh, uh, challenge and today if we see just the capital market side the percent of the capital market side is probably financed by the American banks today then we have to accelerate probably our thinking if we want to address that, not in 10 years, but before. What's your, your opinion about this conversion? I, full, I fully share your views. You know, I, as, I, as I said in the, in, the, in the question before about capital market unions, I view, I, be, I, I view the capital market unions as very complementary to banks and helping banks. And I think that's something that we need to, to pursue and to try to pursue further. I also think, and, and you were pointing to this, that the part of the paradox since the great financial crisis is that the relative size, and I'm just not talking on, on, on market cap, which is obvious, you know, also on the market share 
of European banks versus non-European banks, mainly American banks, in certain parts of the financial industry uh, has declined a lot, the market share of, of European banks. And that potentially is, is a challenge that we need to address. I mean, we need to be careful about making sure that we have a proper, and I'm not going to talk only about banks, but a proper financial sector to finance the growth of the European economy. You know, and that, of course, that financial sector has to be and should be integrated globally as much as possible, but it should be it should have sufficient strength commensurate to the size of, of, of the European economy. And I think that's that's one of the challenges. I mean, the relative, as I say, you know, the relative size of European banks, of the large European banks relative to the large uh, international banks has shifted. The market share of European banks in certain parts, particularly of the investment banking industry, I would say, you know, has significantly declined. And this is an area of concern. This is a challenge that we need to address. I fully agree. And capital market unions will play a, a, a very important role there, I hope. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now a question on uh, Brexit, maybe. Uh, so, there must be some practical consequences on Brexit, on Brexit on the on EBA, like uh, for budget uh, governance uh, staff. And uh, how do you do you leave that? And uh, what are what will be, if any, the future relationship between the EBA and the banking um, uh, English banking authorities? Thank you. No, I appreciate the question. Uh, in terms of the, from the EBA's operation, there's been significant implications. You know, as, as I like to say, we are probably one of the first concrete evidence of Brexit because we moved our headquarters from London to Paris. As mm. as Brexit, we came here last year. We've been fully operational here in France in June of last year. Very happy to do so, to be honest. Uh, and I, 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 I'll say this here just as a reference for you guys. Uh, we are actually very happily surprised by the way we've been treated by the Euro by the French authorities at all levels. You know, they really have helped us uh, uh, to make sure, and they have shown concerns, which in great times is, is more important you know, to make sure that we are established here in a in a productive manner. And, and our staff has massively moved. We have not seen any significant uh, withdrawal of, of people. You know, about ten percent over the last eighteen months, which is more or less the average that we have had in the previous six years. So no significant, and we're happily here. Uh, it's been it's been a difficult year between between the if I may say between between the, the strikes of the fall and, and the COVID and the COVID in the spring. <laughs> Got getting, getting back yeah. into the office has not been easy, but we've been very productive. It's been very good in that sense. Our relationship with the PRA and the FCA, which are two, which are our two main counterparts in the UK, you know, the Prudential Regulatory Authority and the Financial Conduct Authority of the UK, has been good. They were members of our board until until the beginning of this year. They are no longer sit on our board, but we engage with them. We have drafted a memorandum of understanding to engage with them. So we'll continue. We'll continue to engage with like th other third countries. So in that sense, it's good. I'm also relatively comfortable with the with the situation of the industry as we as we hit January first. You know, our assessment at this stage is that is that there should not be any at least significant financial disruption. You know, that I think most most banks. Uh, have done uh, a lot of their homework. They're still uh, lagging a little bit on, on moving people, mainly lately because of the COVID, moving some positions in the banking sector. We know that in the market area, you know, it's going to be a high reliance and still a, a longer transition sure. for some part, particularly for CCPs. But uh, I hope that we're relatively well prepared for January and that we continue to engage in a in a in a productive manner. I mean, the, the, the links to the UK financial sector, of course, will remain mm -hmm. very large for many years to come, that's for sure. Okay. And what about the um, uh, relationship with the French banking industry? Do you view it as uh, uh, very strong? Do, do you Would you like to have more contacts, more interaction? Uh, would you like to engage more with uh, re the representatives of, uh, of some banking institutions? How do you view the local relationship with the EBA? I, I think we have very good relations. I mean, we, have, we have regular regular meetings with the, with the Banking Federation. We have engagements with, with our regular bases. We also meet bilateral with some groups of banks, uh, depending on the, on the topics. Uh, I was surprised probably more intense with the larger banks, logically, than, than with the smaller banks. And the smaller banks is more through, through industry associations and industry groups. We also interact a lot with the European Banking Federation. In which you know the 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 French banks uh, participate, as well as with the other European 
lot of European confederation of associations, be them savings banks, cooperative banks, other type of, of, of business models or institutional organizations. So I think the, the engagement has been has been good and active. We also engage, by the way, with other stakeholders, the consumers associations, you know, which are important. We just had a, a meeting last week, an open meeting of financial education. We had a large number of of NGOs and other uh, organizations interested in enhancing the education, uh, the financial education of citizens in the European Union, which is a very important aspect. So I would say that that the overall engagement has been good, you know, and, and again, both through our consultation processes and also in bilateral meetings, I think it's been it's been quite fluid. Okay. And maybe I will have an, another, because we're speaking about dialogues between different uh, institutions, uh, but one dialogue which is quite important is uh, your relation with the ECB, because it's clear that the ECB now framework is uh, now a, a major supervisor, and from time uh, a big supervisor can interfere with uh, the uh, implementation of regulation. As you are the regulator, how you see this uh, balance between the regulate the supervisory interaction in interpretation of regulation and the regulators that try to fix the rule. Uh, how you manage this uh, this balance or sometimes perceive unbalanced uh, relations? Well, uh, there, there, there are two dimensions, as you say, you know, we, one is just the relation between a regulator, a regulator and a supervisor, which applies to the world. The other one is just the, the, the SSM ECB, of course, applies to the banking union. Mm -hmm. Responsibility for the single market of the EU. So there's also this this potential differences of view between you know what was perceived to be for the banking union only versus what's perceived to be to all the 27 member countries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was mentioned before. For example, from home host yeah. interactions, we have had a, a number of uh, more difficult situations in which we actually act as mediators between the between the home authority. In this case, was the SSM and the host authority, which was a non a non banking union country. But I would say our relationship is very fluid. We have very significant levels of meetings at all levels. You know, I, I engage regularly with, with Andrea. Of course, we have the benefit now that Andrea knows the NBA very well as well. Yeah. So that's, that's, a, that's a good starting place. Uh, and I think it's quite fluid. They, they attend and they, they participate in all of our working groups, all the way up to our board of supervisors as non-voting member, but some member. So I would say it, it's, it's good. Is, is active um, in the important issues I think we are aligned. Okay, Michel, do you have other major questions? Because well, we have... just one maybe on um, AML. Uh, this yeah. is an area of uh, responsibility, enhanced responsibility for the ABA, uh, anti-money laundering. Um, there seems to be continuing progress, but still we are sometimes surprised by some still situation or even scandals that uh, emerge. Do, do, do you remain optimistic for um, a soon having a comprehensive, efficient system that will uh, that will secure uh, the uh, anti-money laundering uh, um, um, framework? So, so there seems to be continuing progress, but still we are never quite there. How, how do you view that? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. This is one of the situations where you, th you think you're moving, but the target may be moving faster than you. So yeah. you're actually maybe farther away every time. You know? yeah. And I think that uh, on, on the, I'm, I'm positive, I'm optimistic because I think there is momentum that has been built. You know, the commission is putting forward, as you know, the, 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 they had a consultation on reforms in this area. We actually provided them a call for advice on technical aspects of the regulation where we see, where we clearly indicated we think that there should be a more prescriptive regulation. Now we have the AML directive and this is very principle based. There are certain parts of that I think we think that should be moved into a European regulation. So there's more homogeneity across the board and other parts of the directive that while still maybe remaining as directive, they should not be so principle based but more prescriptive. So as to this as to describe for instance what are clear minimums of resources and organizational structure that national supervisors need to have in this area. What are minimal competences that they need to have, uh, which right now is not, is not well specified. That's one aspect. The second aspect is, and we've been working a lot on this, is that collaboration and cooperation in this area has been very weak. 
is very weak, both between national authorities within a country, because usually you have several authorities involved. You tend to have, like, the, in the banking sector, the prudential authority that then talks to the AML authority, that talks to the financial intelligence union unit, that then maybe talks to the, to the more the prosecution aspects of individual cases. And communication in those, in those instances is difficult. And then cross-border communication has been even more difficult. So, you know, to get an AML authority for one country to report to another one in another country, that's been more difficult. So we actually have created a committee at the EBA since January, in which we sit all the AML authorities of the European Union sit in this committee. So that's an opportunity to, to engage them. They're building a database of information, of intelligence to enhance communication. We have requested that they put forward and recommend in our guidelines that they put forward AML colleges for cross-border banks, so that the AML authorities, the same way that the Prudential authorities meet in Prudential colleges, the AML authorities will meet on an AML college to discuss the AML situation of a bank and how they assess that. And that's starting. That's good progress. But that's progress, I would call, from the existing regulation, which is a minimum. Mm -hmm. So we need to build up on the regulation as well. And let's see if I think the Commission is planning to put forward their proposal by the end of the year. And let's let's see if in, in the process of next year there's an agreement reached on how to enhance that. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Well, Edouard, I think we are getting close to 10, so it's maybe time to, to, to conclude. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay, uh, Jose Emmanuel. Uh, Thank you very much for this uh, discussion. Uh, as I, I, I said uh, during the introduction, uh, the mission of uh, the European Institute of Financial Regulation is to, uh, to, to have this type of uh, dialogue. Um, our motto, uh, I call our motto as being uh, responsible, smart, and lean regulation. And responsible means uh, not just the green dimension, but means we are responsible by aligning regulation with the overall strategy, meaning the overall interest of um, uh, the pan-European financial industry toward the expectation of the citizens. How we can make uh, the financial industry a common good, which is a major challenge. That's why we have to be collectively responsible. And when I, we, speak, we speak about smart regulation, we don't mean like uh, in the Anglo-Saxon world, uh, worse or better regulation, but how we can maintain the proper balance all the times between regulators and the regulees on the way this regulation is constructed and, and implemented. And when we speak about lean regulation, is that uh, sometimes uh, some actors think that the, the cost of complexity of regulation is too high. Then how, as in the normal industrial environment, uh, even in the financial industry, we can have the lean objective as one of our collective objective. That is more or less uh, the mission of uh, our institute. And as uh, we, we, we have this discussion, and you mentioned several times the level of dialogue between the sh stakeholders and all the different participants, and it's clear that common understanding from each perspective, supervisors, actors, um, regulators. And if uh, from all this perspective, we have a common understanding based on this uh, continuous uh, dialogue in those very historical times that we have, uh, COVID crisis, uh, competition, uh, that means that we can all together be optimistic uh, facing this, uh, this future with a lot of challenges, but if we have the proper level of dialogue, probably we'll be able to face these challenges successfully. Okay, thank you very much for this uh, discussions, and we, it is clear that it's a, a continuous uh, process, and uh, if we can help the process, we'll be very happy. Thank you very much, Jose Manuel. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's been a real pleasure. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.